All right, let's talk a bit about early historical combat. What I mean by early is before the time of the instructional manuscripts that describe specific techniques and often show them in drawn illustrations. So before that, it is very speculative. Now we have some sources, for example, about Viking combat, the old Icelandic sagas talk about fighting. They describe it in varying degrees of detail and you can you know, draw some conclusions from that. It is tentative. Now, some groups are, you know, have come up with some pretty interesting martial arts systems. They generally say, you know, make clear that it is speculative. Uh, Hearst Week, for example, they do a lot of reconstruction, but um, yeah, I said they, they clearly say it is speculative because the issue with these things is, even if you come up with a martial arts system around, for example, the Dane Axe, that works really well, we don't know for sure if that's how they fought. Just because it works doesn't mean that's how they did it. There are always you know, more options than one. Uh, there are some very plausible techniques in the sagas. For example, one of the things you, you have uh, described is thrusting with the, the horn of the axe blade into someone's throat which is, yeah, that's perfectly possible. So that seems plausible. However, there are also cases of what I would personally call Viking Hollywood, where they clearly exaggerated just for the sake of storytelling. Um, especially also you have to keep in mind that people at the time didn't have this concept of objectivity that we have nowadays in the sciences. And they weren't concerned about you know, telling history, you know, as close to reality, like as precisely, you know, exactly this is how it was. They they always were, you know, quick to take liberties and, you know, make the story more interesting or leave out things that they didn't personally like, etc. There can be accurate accounts. It's not all, you know, make-believe and whatnot. Like, for example, the stories of you know, the discovery of Vinland, meaning uh, North America, by the Vikings. That's, we actually have archeological evidence that shows that yes, they were indeed there. And a lot of the things they talk about in the sagas are indeed plausible. However, there are also things like, and this right here I'm gonna to read to you. He kicked the bottom of the shield up into his mouth so hard that his face ripped open and his jaws fell down to his chest. Now that's just, crazy. There's no way I believe that this actually happened. If we have a shield like this, we can generally assume that most of the time they didn't have a metal rim because there are few finds of metal rims, which would be more likely to be preserved. But there are many cases where you have the boss preserved, but no metal rim. So either they they just covered it in leather or rawhide or whatever, or didn't cover it at all. So to think that this would be driven into somebody's face hard enough to just split it in half, that's just ludicrous. I mean, to generate that sort of force, that would most likely break the shin of the person kicking the shield or the foot before that would actually happen. So that seems uh, very, very unlikely to say the least. Now this one, I definitely do not by at all. So there's one story where um, a fighter takes, you know, grabs the opponent by both shoulders and there's a rock behind him and he jumps backwards over the rock and then pulls the other guy down and splits him in half over the rock. No. That, that's, that's, we're not made of paper mache. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you would see on The Walking Dead. You know, he just pulls him on the rock and then just his, his body just rips apart. No, no, that, that's, that's kind of absurd gore you would see in a horror movie and a cheap horror movie at that. And so I absolutely do not believe that. So aside from sagas and other written accounts, what can we use if we want to come up with a speculative reconstruction of how they might have fought back then? Let me just point out that I'm absolutely not claiming to be an authority on this whatsoever. I've been practicing historical martial arts based on late medieval and renaissance manuals and we can speculate based on those. For example, sword and buckler techniques are applicable to larger shields as well. Um, not all of them work the same way, but you can 
assume that there might have been some carryover, but it might also have been completely different because we're talking several hundred years in between here. So a lot may have changed, especially also considering that a buckler is quite a bit different than a shield. Well, there has been the whole debate about whether a Viking sword was used with a hammer grip or a handshake grip, or if it were you know, throwing it out like this and you know, letting it slide down. If you were to use the hammer grip, you would have to use you know, more draw cuts, so closer to the body, which also makes sense. You know, both can be effective if you're doing it well, but we don't really know. And in fact, also one thing I should point out as well, there is really no reason to assume that everybody thought the same way. You know, even if you go by just Vikings in particular, there's no guarantee that they all had the same style. In fact, I would say it's quite likely that there were different fighting styles. Might, it might have been regional differences, there may have been personal differences. So, you know, different people may have preferred different things. In fact, it's possible that people back then even debated which grip is better. Even when trying to exclude impractical things, again, we don't know for sure. For example, a really bad thing to do is either in a thrust or a cut is this kind of broken wrist position where you overextend the wrist and that takes quite a toll on the tendons. You can injure yourself very easily and it's not as efficient biomechanically. So you can say that, oh, they definitely didn't do that. They didn't want to mess up their wrists and everything, but do you know for sure? Not really. People did all kinds of counterproductive things back then. There were very dubious, quote unquote, medical practices that did more harm than good that you know, people just weren't aware of. Now, that's not to say that people were stupid. Not at all. They just had limited knowledge and especially their anatomical knowledge was very often limited. So things like this, they might not necessarily have been aware of. And this kind of thing is not that easy to figure out. I mean, if if you don't immediately get wrist pain as soon as you do a couple of those swings, and most likely you won't, it, the, the problem is going to show up later. And when it does, then it's hard to figure out why. You know, what is this connected to? So those are all things to keep in mind. To give you another example, how to hold the shield. You can either hold it flat in front of yourself, or you can hold it angled or some variation thereof with sword and buckler. Both versions do exist for particular techniques. And you can think about, so what are the implications of that? Now, if you're, if you're thinking warriors in a shield wall, obviously it's gonna be flat in front of themselves because the shields all overlap one another. There's one here, one there. So obviously you have to hold it in front of you like this then, and then that means you have to strike over it in some way. Now, this also has implications for how you hold the sword, of course. So it may very well make sense to use the hammer grip in this case, and indeed do you know, fairly short strokes like this, because that way, if you look here, my hand actually stays behind the shield most of the time, as opposed to if I wanted to get maximum reach and just, you know, throw it out like this. Now the entire arm is past the shield. So that seems very exposed. Now, again, they might have done it. I don't think it's particularly likely. It seems more likely that they would try to, you know, stay behind the shield as much as possible and not expose the hand too much. That also applies to holding the shield like this in a one-on-one -on -one duel. So this way I can actually throw a cut like this while staying with my arm behind my shield so I don't get my arm cut off in the process of cutting like this. Some things are equally plausible. For instance, when you hold the shield like this, what's mainly exposed is the legs. So the legs would be a prime target. We also see that in archeological evidence, a lot of skeletons with uh, cuts to the, the leg bones. And um, so the question now is, how do you defend against a cut to your legs? You can either move the shield down, you know, just move your arm down, which would be a really bad idea because then you're extremely exposed. So they could faint to the leg and then cut to your upper body, or you can move your entire body down thereby covering your, your leg and not having to expose 
your upper body as much, or you could just take a step back, what we call a leg void. So that way, your legs out of the way, no risk. They could have done all three of these, they could have preferred one of the three, hard to say. If we want to speculate about fighting with a Danax, we could look at the later medieval pole axe manuscripts, but the problem is those are most likely different because that's fighting in full plate armor, which is substantially different than fighting in just clothing or mail. And we don't even know how they swung them. I mean, it may seem simple, it's an axe, you just swing it and hit somebody, but there's a lot of variables. For example, how do you hold it? Do you want more control, so your hands are further apart, so there's not as much power, but more control? Do you want to hold it further down, so you have one hell of a swing, but are not as agile? And even which hand generates the power? You know, do you swing with, with the main hand, like this, in kind of a chopping motion, or do you swing with the off hand, like this, which can generate a lot more power, but there's, there's so many questions. We have absolutely no idea. And once again, different people may have done it differently. I suppose some weapons are easier to reconstruct than others. A spear, for example, is one of the simplest weapons. Now, don't get me wrong, you can get extremely complex and advanced in spear techniques, but it is a pointy stick. So the simplest thing you can do is thrust, you know, faint, faint high, thrust low, faint low, thrust high, etc. And quarterstaff techniques are perfectly applicable. And in that case, the basics remain the same. So with the quarterstaff in the manuals, they do show a lot of thrusts. And you can use that with a spear just fine. And many of the techniques with a quarterstaff absolutely apply. For example, you know, pushing the opponent's spear aside or knocking it aside, and then you know keeping the opponent's spear or quarterstaff bound and thrusting. This, in fact, even has some similarities to rapier fencing, oddly enough. So there's a lot of questions about it. My personal point of view is it's very interesting to try to speculate about fighting methods and you can absolutely come up with techniques and systems that work, that are effective and plausible and that are, you know, are likely to have been used in one way or another, as long as you don't claim that, yeah, you know exactly how they did it and then this must be it. And how do you know? We, we just always have to keep in mind that it is just our modern interpretation. The same applies to the later manuscripts as well. We never 100% know if this is exactly how they did it. It is always interpretation. But you know, the further back in time you go, the more speculative it becomes. When we get to, you know, Celts, for example, this gets really murky. But anyway, just wanted to ramble a little bit about that. So hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.